Hey guys, welcome to Star Wars Timeline. Surprise! I have Mike from Genuine Chit Chat once again. Mike, we haven't spoken for a million years. I miss you, man. We had a pretty interesting podcast last time. We spoke about accents in Star Wars, which you and I were just talking about off screen. It's like, how do you make it into a topic? Or furthermore, how do you continue and make a part two of that podcast and keep talking about accents? Before we begin, guys, Mike, please introduce yourself to the audience who is seeing you for the first time. Tell us what you're all about, where people can listen to your podcast and so forth. That's wonderful. So thank you once again for having me on for the fifth time, I think. No, sixth time, because it was once for the trilogies, then one for each of the trilogies, then accents, and then again. So six times. Um, thank you very much. Um, I pleasure. have got two main podcasts. I've got Genuine Chits Chat, where I've honest conversations with interesting people. I've had Ben on the show. I had him at, uh, late 2021, where we spoke about Russia and animation, mm -hmm. and just obviously Star Wars came up. Um, and I've also had a variety of other guests. I've had some people who've created Star Wars content, like Claudia Gray, or Paolo Villanelli. I've had completely nothing to do with Star Wars guests. I've had musical guests, other podcasters, travelers, etc. So it's really just anyone who's interested by, you know, any wide variety of conversations. Um, and then my other show is Star Wars Comics in Canon, where I tackle all the Star Wars comics in the Canon. Currently, I'm doing pretty much all the Marvel stuff. And then I'm going to delve into a bit more IDW stuff. But I have been touching a few of those. At the moment, I'm focusing on the High Republic. I'm doing book reviews, which are spoiler free. And then as you go throughout the review, I give warnings. And uh, towards the end, I'll then give plot details so people can listen if they aren't planning on reading the books necessarily and then the comics i specifically uh formulate in a way where you can listen to it you get the plot details you hear about connections to other content like the species or characters that reappear or right. planets and things um and then i go through the plot details and whatnot so you get a good understanding of it but i don't go through absolutely 100 of it so if you want to listen to it as a refresher, or if you still want to pick up the comic after I've spoken about it, it's a really good way for anyone trying to get into the realm of Star Wars comics in there, or a refresher if you've already read them. But um, you can find both of those shows if you're uh, listening on YouTube, which I presume you are, or watching, uh, then you can check out Genuine Chit Chat. I'm sure Ben will put into the uh, description. It's got all of my Star Wars videos and all of my uh, Genuine Chit Chat videos. They're all in playlists. You can find them all there, um, or you can find it on any podcast app of your choice. Just type in either Genuine Chit Chat or Star Wars Comics in Canon, and Comics in Canon is on the feed of Comics in Motion. So that's my big old plug, and you can find me on social media at Genuine Chit Chat as well. So, <laughs> And this is how you guys words. separate a uh, uh, a beginner like myself versus Michael, who's able to talk for five minutes nonstop, but a single interruption. I feel jealous. <laughs> <laughs> that was the abridged version as well. I could just talk for an hour, just rambling. <laughs> and I also feel jealous because you quickly have become the expert on what's happening in the current events as far as the Star Wars comic books are concerned. Guys, Mike and his podcasts and his shows are the ones I would recommend, are the ones you go to, honestly, if you want to know your stuff about comic books. I am nowhere near an authority that you are. If I can claim and put my little stop my foot and put my flag, say, I know my Star Wars legends, I would highly, highly recommend to you. Like just so much passion and excitement that you share for Star Wars comic books. It's awesome. But guys, quick much. reminder. So last time you and I wanted to talk about George Lucas, like in many, many films, you know, he's not the first or the last person to do it, but he had a very, made a conscious effort since the origins of Star Wars to put accents in his films for a very specific reason, to paint a very specific picture. We went through original trilogy of films. You and I, we have highlighted all of those tiny role imperial actors, those small roles that they play and how pivotal they were in portraying that, that military machine, that, that, Galactic Empire. It wasn't just Vader. It wasn't just the Emperor. It was a group of these supremely talented actors who were used so minimally economically, but so effectively that since my childhood, even though I couldn't tell apart their uh, British accents because, you know, I was raised with dubbed versions of Star Wars, still rewatching it over and over finally in English is just without them, I feel there would be no Star Wars. So I want to continue our uh, trend and talk about prequels. This is George Lucas, who I, I feel had a different mindset. He matured as a filmmaker, he matured as a person. He wanted to bring different set of ideas into his prequels, right? If a lot of people talk about the original trilogy as classical Greek hero's journey, here there is a lot of Judaic Christian uh, motifs here in this movie, particularly the, the Christian, the, the crucifixion of its fallen hero, Anakin Skywalker. So I wanted to begin with sort of 
Phantom Menace, uh, as we spoke, Mike, um, don't keep it too strict. If you feel you want to jump ahead and discuss other movies as well, I just want to keep it in the ballpark so we're more or less organized what we're talking about. But I wanted to start and focus on the the four big characters, the four big roles, the characters that honestly carry the entire prequel trilogy. This is Liam Neeson, who portrays Qui- uh, Qui-Gon Jinn. We got Ewan McDiarmid, who, uh, uh, I'm sorry, Ewan McGregor, who plays Obi-Wan Kenobi. Ewan McDiarmid, who plays uh, uh, Chancellor Palpatine. We got Natalie Portman, who plays Padme. And we got Jack Lloyd, who plays Anakin. You know, if we can start breaking apart these characters and try to understand what was George's intent of superimposing particular accents over those characters and what what was the intent what did he try to accomplish and how you and i as two fans who come from completely different backgrounds interpreted them so if you could begin with qui-gon jinn and obi-wan kenobi those are the first two heroes that we meet in this trilogy as far Mm -hmm. as i'm concerned i would say the first film is theirs you might effectively call it the adventures of qui-gon jinn and obi-wan kenobi and it's in their initial adventure they stumble upon this the child of prophecy talk about them what's happening with their respective accents why that particular choice of actor why that particular choice of accent and what did it add to the film so i think that when you speak about obi-wan i think that's gonna be more so comparing over these three movies um, of the prequels and i think that um, one thing that a character you mentioned as well, I think, um, which was uh, Natalie Portman with Padme. I think they're in your notes. She's someone who I really want to highlight because I think she changes the most from uh, Phantom Menace to Attack of the Clones to Revenge of the Sith. So I think she's quite an interesting uh, show of the difference. But if we obviously take a step back and continue with uh, Qui-Gon and with Obi-Wan, Qui-Gon in particular, he is very calm and collected. Now, Liam Neeson, I believe he is a Scottish actor, I think. Um, And so you can hear like a mild twang in his voice just slight but it's not a heavy one it's not a very mm. strong accent like the Nemoidians have or like Watto has or people like that it, it's very subtle but not only is it the accent but obviously what we kind of alluded to in our last conversation was that it's not just the accent itself it's also the word choice the mannerisms in speech how they carry themselves you know being confident or being quite uh, shy that's quite a big right. influence on how your voice sounds And with Qui-Gon in particular, he has, because he's so calm and collected, but he's very specific in what he says, he's very knowledgeable. And within a few words, obviously, you know, one of the first things that Ewan McGregor says to him is he refers to him as master, because that's, you know, Mm -hmm. the uh, Padawan-master relationship. So you already get that authority sort of balance skew from the get-go. But with Qui-Gon, you need to believe that he knows a lot. You need to know from the start that he knows what he's talking about. And with the journey that Lucas takes you on in The Phantom Menace, you know, one of the biggest tragedies is Qui-Gon dying. And I think that what The Phantom Menace really shows, and I think that Dave Filoni really touched upon this uh, a couple years ago in an interview, but it's basically just like the whole Maul battle and things, uh, when Qui-Gon died, that's the dark side winning. That's the Mm -hmm. first real win for the dark side, like a thousand Mm -hmm. years, because he is the person who if he'd have trained Anakin, then the whole of the events of the prequels could have been completely different. And all these sorts of breadcrumbs layers, whether or not George Lucas thought of them specifically while making Phantom Menace or after the fact or its interpretation, regardless of that sort of caveat, I want to just look at it in a way of what we kind of see now and what it establishes for any viewers who watch the Phantom Menace, it establishes that, you know, everyone generally agrees that Qui-Gon is brilliant and that he is such this, He's not quite the perfect mentor, but he accepts when he's wrong. He gives uh, Obi-Wan the right amount of sort of uh, congratulations when he does things right, but he's not overly gratuitous with it. He's a very balanced mentor. And he's such a balanced person. One of my favorite parts about him is a line that Obi-Wan kind of says to him, which is, you know, if you uh, did this a bit more frequently, then the council would, sort of, you'd be on the Jedi Council. And he's yeah. like, I don't, I don't really want to be on the council. I don't care. He's not fussed about being in this, you know, clicky in a Jedi right. order part. He just wants to do what he believes is right, which is mm-hmm. what the living force wants him to do. And I just think the way he holds himself in every conversation and everything he says, everyone listens to him. And I think that the accent that he has as well as, because obviously where he's, I'm pretty certainly Scottish. I'm going to keep saying that. <laughs> I, I think I looked at him briefly. Uh, his background said that he's Irish. Irish, I'm, then I'm completely wrong there. Uh, but his mm-hmm. his accent then, that is still based in Britain. 
And we've got a lot of characters like, you know, in A New Hope, what we discussed last time was Obi-Wan Kenobi and the Imperials were the two British. Mm -hmm. Obi-Wan's, the way he speaks is very different to the way that Peter Cushing's Tarkin speaks. And in this one, I think with his, with Qui-Gon's roots in that British feel once again, obviously Ewan McGregor is also British. He's, I think he's the Scottish one. That's why I'm getting confused. (laughs) That's where, that's why I'm getting confused with it. Right. But that kind of, the British stereotypical being well spoken and being articulate and you know with Qui-Gon especially holding the room and everyone listening to him very much it immediately establishes him as wise and someone you should listen to and he's kind of you know although Obi-Wan is in this quite a bit Qui-Gon is I think has the most screen time of anyone in this film he that's very rare to have a scene where he's not in it right. because he goes to Tatooine without um Obi well, he explores Tatooine uh Mos Eisley mm-hmm. without um obi-wan and so in those things i just think that the way he speaks really needs to show he commands a room he's the person you need to follow your eyes need to follow your mind needs to follow him and i think just the way liam neeson speaks and this goes for lots of liam neeson roles you know he plays in the remake of clash of the titans he plays zeus and there's a lot of roles that he has where he is he's a man in control like in taken or he's an authority figure like in clash of the titans Mm -hmm. there's so many elements of just the way liam neeson is has that kind of immediate authority or powerful or Mm -hmm. intelligent role and i think that qui-gon really encapsulates that element of things Um, what i spoke a lot then what about yourself (laughs) when it comes to uh qui-gon and obi-wan no it's actually a very very fascinating uh take you know you uh, i love how you break it down and you actually always bring back what we're discussing here you know when we're talking about accents we're obviously still talking about acting we're still obviously talking about uh, 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 uh voice acting right as on screen, you appear on screen, you have to dub over your, your role, but it also character types where the Liam Neeson is and Ewan McGregor is. For me, it was a quite a different experience because it was one of the first movies that I saw in English, right, in theaters. And it was jarring, first of all, hearing Obi-Wan's Kenobi, uh, Kenobi's British accent. So in Russian schools, I was taught to it was, you know, speak English with British accent. Then I had to come to here in New York City and learn to speak with American accent. And I just, it didn't dawn on me because I always watched Star Wars with dubbing that Obi-Wan has a British accent, which is very easy for me to tell apart because that's what I picked up on first. I said, okay, that's what he's doing here. But now another jarring part of the aspect of the film is, I think you and I spoke about it uh, earlier in our previous podcast, that the idea of a prequel was pretty novel, pretty new. Mm. And for us, I was 19 years old. I'm going in. I was like, hold on a second. So I got to rewind. We're going back in time. Oh, okay. This is the beginning of the story now. And he's a less experienced. He's not the Kenobi we meet in originally. He's a young, inexperienced, eager young man. And he's there to please his master. Bless you. Here we go for it. (laughs) (laughs) Um, Qui-Gon Jinn, on the other hand, you know, first of all, Liam Neeson, you know, I, I knew him from Schindler's List, which I saw in Russia, you know, my whole family, everybody's blown away with this performance. We came over here, we saw Rob Roy, you know, everybody all over the world, people just love his uh, talent. But uh, you're right, you, you hit it right in the spot when Qui-Gon Jinn needed to be the Gandalf of that story. He needed that regalia, he needed that, that pose, and he's there as a wise man who picks his words and as we later learn throughout the years through all the literature and books and later on and we have this filled out version of Qui Gon Jinn beyond the the movie screen is that he's also a maverick he is the guy who doesn't strictly adhere to the Jedi code he challenges that and I think within that specific accent and within Liam's performance there's that hidden reserve of rebellion which is not quite like Obi-Wan's if Obi-Wan's is this innocent youth of trying to be you know, approving that his master is approving of his actions. Qui-Gon Jinn is a lot more calculated, seasoned, and experienced. And his challenge is on a completely different level. He's like, look, we're failing here. You're not listening to the call of the force. This child, this boy is special. What's going on here? I'm going to train him despite what you're doing. And I think partially that his Irish or British accent, you're much closer there. You're the native. You tell me exactly what it's like. But I, I think besides that specific point is that it brings that regal persona that Qui Gon was supposed to be, and because of Liam Neeson's performance and Ewan McGregor's performance, uh, you you are convinced. If we can criticize the film's overall narrative from today till Sunday, we can all agree that performances that actors give are awesome. 
Mm. Um, and to move away from this, you know, um, we had Ian McDiarmid, who majority of the, pretty much all of the time, he stays Palpatine. Well, in the few Hall of Scenes, right, he converts to uh, the Emperor, which we'll discuss, uh, you know, a little bit deeper later on. But he has also that British accent, but he's a lot more soothing, a lot calmer. And it's like, hey, I'm here to defuse the situation. I'm the politician. I'm the good guy. Everything will turn out well. He's a snake that whispers in the ear. But what I, the next character that I really wanted you to address, and you feel free to jump into Ian McDiarmid uh, as you want, but Padme, what's going on with her? Because when she's posing as the queen, George directed Natalie Portman in a very specific, surprising way, which I can't still figure out what was the intention here. Obviously, to kind of like hide her identity because she needs all these you know maids behind her to kind of recover for her and be her doubles. But then when she's out of the costume, and she is the maid Padme, and the way she talks to Anakin is quite different. And now, if you want to tie them in together and talk, talk about them as a couple, then you have young Jack, J, Jake Lloyd, who has this fully blown American accent. What, what's the dynamic between Padme and young Anakin Skywalker? Yeah, and I think that Padme is one of the most interesting ones because, as I alluded to earlier, her accent and the, her, her general way of speaking changes the most. Right. Now, Obviously, she's in the Clone Wars as well, and I know there's some notes about the Clone Wars in, as a whole, but I think the voice actress who um, played Padme in the Clone Wars did an excellent job. She sounds very similar to Natalie Portman. So if in this, what I'm about to say is mainly focusing on Phantom Menace, Attack of the Clones, and Revenge of the Sith. With her initially, you've got that regality, but to... Um, in excess i'd say you know and it's, mm. i think it's meant to be that you know she's like they say a couple of times she's like the youngest queen Naboo have ever had and obviously what would a 12 or 13 year old person think a queen has to do well they have to they would kind of overdo it a little bit i don't think that was the intention i want to clarify this mm -hmm. is kind of speaking somewhat in the star wars universe somewhat out the star wars universe um but i don't think it was necessarily the intention to overdo it but it did kind of come across that way and it actually worked a little bit and with her sort of change, it shows that, you know, A, in Natalie Portman's an excellent actress, um, which, you know, is never something I've ever disputed. But also it shows that there's this duality of mm. the persona which she has to have in front of people, which is the queen, which is this, uh, the face of Naboo for the best people's interest. And then there's the Padme that we actually get to see much more in Attack of the Clones of the three films the most, which is once again, the rebellious one, the one that kind of does what she wants, the maverick. You know, you've got these kind of threads and you have it a little bit when she's a handmaiden, mm -hmm. but the handmaiden Padme is what Anakin falls in love with, not right. the regal Padme. And that's, and the regal Padme kind of lives and dies in this movie. Then the, the handmaiden Padme, she's the one who comes to the, the front in the next two movies. And the way that their accents kind of differ, I have a note here, which is young Anakin, he speaks in more of a slang. It's less formal, you know, especially mm -hmm. when he speaks compared mm -hmm. to Qui-Gon. Qui-Gon is almost very full sentences. Uh, for any listeners who've seen like, Brooklyn Nine-Nine, you've got uh, Holt, and he never, he, never, he never says, like, don't or hasn't. He says, do not, has not. He, he never abbreviates anything. He says things in full sentences, and you can really go along with it. And that's how Qui-Gon speaks. With Anakin, it's more of like, um, you know, what are you going to do? You know, not what are you going to do, what are you going to do? Because he's on this, you know, he's a slave. He's um, on Tatooine, which is not quite lawless necessarily, but it's certainly not one of the core worlds. It's not very built up. So you don't have that baseline of education. You don't have the Jedi Order educating you and making sure you speak properly and right. all these other things you do. And you don't have the Naboo regality, which is you need to be a monarch, you need to be this. So you've got these characters, excluding Jar Jar, that surround Anakin, who are all from a place where they have got, formal education compared to this slave boy who's kind of for lack of a better word grown up on the streets it's not quite that simple but i think that the way that they speak with each other and the way they just interact and communicate is very reflective on their how they've really grown up because you don't get it with characters where you know unless they're trying to pawn over you or specifically the whole point of the character is kind of trying to disprove this but usually when a character is very very well spoken and speaks in articulate full sentences mm -hmm. they're either really clever um very authoritative or super evil they seem to be the three 
right. primary archetypes um, of people when they speak uh, very, very specifically like that. Mm -hmm. So I think that when you've got the comparison between Anakin, Qui-Gon and Padme, especially when they're in uh, Anakin and Shmi's home and they're all speaking, when you hear them all talking slightly differently, Shmi has that sort of... Um, for lack of a better almost rustic twang to it where it's mm -hmm. not quite very formal you've got the two informal slaves speaking right. with two individuals who are brought up in a monarchy and in a, a religion that were both from very young brought up in that education and i think that the accents really evidence this and really mm -hmm. help you without explicitly saying this person from here this person from that which you do get you do just in these conversations you get that kind of uh the backstory in a sense you you get shown it rather than having to explicitly be told that's a it. very interesting very interesting point you hit is that the accent is also meant to tell your story in itself without too much dialogue or exposition telling you the background story right it kind of because we are in the real world culture we're watching a science fiction movie but we pick up on oh this is what it's supposed to mean this artistic direction here like the the you know Padme's beautiful beautiful whether it was one of her garments either tibetan or mongolian outfits right from her last queen of, of from that region and she looks absolutely fantastic we kind of pick up on that stuff artistically and we make sense of it but with padme when i saw it in theaters again my, my english was so so i was like four years five years in the country um she was quite a, a jarring character for me because i Obviously, I knew Natalie Portman from Leo the Professional, right? Luc Besson's film in Russia, like all the kids would love that movie. Uh, but with her, something weird happened. First, I don't want to get into the specifics of how George directed her acting-wise, but it was very hard to associate with her alter ego, which is Queen Amidala. I don't think that's true. Padme, Padme is the real one to me, at least in my mind, and Queen, Queen Amidala is alter ego. That formal person who has to take bear the weight of the of this planet's well being and make all these right calls at a very early age versus this this just young bright passionate woman, free right? free woman exactly who grows up to fall in love with this young boy that in the beginning she befriends him she sympathizes with his cause and she's unable to help him that's the tragedy in itself but when she is performing in that very, very cold, dispassionate tone. I just got to say that I felt that for me, unfortunately, it wasn't the right directing call because it completely removes you, whether intentional or not, it removes you from her raw talent as an actress. It's just very, very cool. To, because my question was without too much analysis, when I was watching it real time in theaters, I'm like, why would a queen talk like this? Mm. Yes, you want to be formal. You want to make an impression on your subject, uh, subjects as well as equals, or in this case, this other nation, which like set embargo on your planet, right? The Nemodians, which we'll get to later. Yeah, you need to sound convincing, and like you that you are also in control of the situation, but not dispassionate, not cold. Again, guys, you please leave comments in the video section below. Feel free to correct. And this is just my interpretation. It was very hard to identify versus anakin which i immediately understood what george is doing with him i i enjoyed jake lloyd's performance once again it's we, we've seen him before with arnold and jingle all the way he was so spriteful and so genuine and so sweet and lovable now we get to this one and he's still doing his thing it's just like just sadly george lucas isn't steven spielberg to be able to extract from a child that every specific performance key by key by key, from shot to shot to shot. It's very, very difficult, very challenging. But he's still still channeling a lot of that. And his particular accent told me that, yes, once again, we're back to Tatooine, the American frontier Tatooine. And he's this young boy, because first and foremost, it's an American film, speaking to an American audience. And he is immediately the invitation for you, for you to kind of like superimpose yourself on that character and say, oh, this is the boy I can identify with. Right, George Lucas also insisted that he made this trilogy specifically for children. From the perspective of young Anakin, it makes all the sense in the world. Who's the pers first person in this movie a young prepubescent child is going to identify with? I'm going to bet it's Anakin. It's like, oh, this, this boy is like me. He talks like me. He's about my age. Ooh, he wants to fly in this pod race. I want to race. You know, kids generally, or a lot of kids, they enjoy cars. They enjoy fast racing and you know, all these, like, hot toys and stuff like this. It makes a lot of sense. So 
if you have any closing comments on these uh, big four that we talked about, there's another interesting character I know we can't miss out on. Well, before we get into that, um, I will say with um, with the young Anakin, uh, not to specifically delve into the acting too much, but I have never had a problem with Jake Lloyd's acting ever. Yeah. It's one, I'm one of the very few people. It's probably one of. But I grew up with prequels. You know, I'm a prequels apologist. There are many, <laughs> many flaws with those movies, and I am more than happy to point them out. But like me and Megan rewatched uh, Attack of the Clones recently because um, I'm going on someone else's podcast, and they chose Attack of the Clones of all movies, um, which will be in a few weeks' time. But we were talking about the prequels because Megan said she really watched wanted to watch the prequels again, and we didn't have time to watch the Phantom Menace, and she was actually kind of upset. And I was like, "That's w- not proper upset," but she was like, "Oh, you know, disappointed." Yeah. to watch it. And we spoke about. She asked me about people being bullied and stuff because I was like, "You know, Riz Ahmed, the person who played Jar Jar, he basically was shunned out of Hollywood. Hayden Christensen shunned out of Hollywood. There's loads of people who have just been completely removed, and then." now with Star Wars Celebration and things so many people now like are loving Hayden Christensen again and loving Mm -hmm. these people and she asked me she was like is Jake Lloyd bullied a lot and I was like oh yeah he was like horrendously bullied I think he was like death threats and she was like I didn't even think he was that bad and I was like I genuinely do not believe and I said I'm happy to defend this that Jake Lloyd wasn't that bad of an actor was he the best kid actor no was he compared to the cast of Stranger Things no no but you know and even Natalie Portman in um in Leon the Professional He's not as good as that, but I never thought he was bad. I just thought, yeah, this right. is a kid on Tatooine. So I think for him, me personally, with him uh, acting, I thought he was completely fine. But mm-hmm. I want to ask you specifically with Obi Wan, um, because as I said, where, where I grew up with the prequels, you know, showing my age here, I was five when the Phantom Menace came out. I didn't mm-hmm. watch it in the cinema. Um, I I don't even know if I watched Attack of the Clones in the cinema. I remember watching Revenge of the Sith in the cinema, which was two thousand five, so I was eleven, but. Me growing up with Star Wars, I had them on VHS tapes. And so I've always associated you, McGregor, uh, with Obi-Wan, as well as Alec Guinness. And I'm intrigued by yourself, and obviously the listeners, I want to hear or see their comments as well, is when people saw you, McGregor, doing Obi-Wan, did that jar you very much for compared to what you used to Alec Guinness? Because certain mm. people I've shown Star Wars have said, oh, I can really see what it was going for. And other people have gone, no, it doesn't sound like him at all. So, but I've always grown up with both. So I, I've always kind of, for me, it's always worked. But I'm interested by you specifically from the Alec Guinness and New Hope to Phantom Menace, you uh, McGregor. Did you find that their accents aligned or did you think it was a bit jarring? You know what? I didn't even pay attention. I didn't even pay attention to him saying hello there, which Obi-Wan says either his first line. I didn't make the connection at all because mm. I went into theaters and without anticipation of what I specifically want. Mm. I don't watch movies like that. I go in and I say, okay, if this is what this thing is. Either yeah. take it or leave it. Either like it or dislike it. it you know, I, I don't need specific check boxes like, oh, if this movie doesn't have that, it's not real Star Wars. I was there with a completely open heart, open mind. I wasn't thinking that what this particular actor is doing is what Alec Guinness was doing. What I was thinking of is, obviously I've seen Ewan McGregor in one or two previous films, but to me, he wasn't a discovered kind of like actor. Mm -hmm. I didn't know a lot about him. And now he's doing this. I'm like, all it took me is to understand that, okay, he's supposed to be younger Obi-Wan Kenobi. And I guess this is kind of diverting from the topic a little bit, but my question was, why isn't he the focal point? Who is this other guy, Qui-Gon Jinn? Doesn't he say that he trains young Anakin? What's going on here? So there's an added dynamic here. There's another Jedi, and I'm like scratching my head. I guess I was a little bit rickrolled by the appearance of, of Qui-Gon Jinn because I'm, my entire movie experience, I'm watching it and I'm thinking to myself, hold on a second, Obi-Wan is here. He is in this movie. What's going to happen to this guy? Mm-hmm. There's no mention of him in the original trilogy. Is he... Is he Bye-bye, is he going? <laughs> so I guess it, my mind was too preoccupied to specifically pay attention to what Ewan McGregor is doing. But I can answer the same question years after, when I lived through that experience, through that acting, through everything. I, to this day, I can't say that he specifically went and studied frame by frame what Alec Guinness is doing. He obviously knew what was happening then in regards to those movies. He did his homework. But I think there is... Ewan McGregor interpreting the role rather than Ewan McGregor doing Alec Guinness. And I love that. It's the same reason I love Alden uh, Elderick's uh, in a solo movie. He's not channeling Harrison Ford. 
Harrison Ford is Han Solo. That's undeniable. He is Indiana Jones. But the big question is, what has happened when the actor outlives the role? You recast him. Sherlock Holmes, you and I, we spoke about it briefly. You have your British version, you have your Russian version, you have American version of Sherlock Holmes. Each actor tries to channel the character first, right? That's what I saw with Ewan McGregor. He is doing that. And I loved, one thing I love about prequels is not only is his performance, but showing the change in growth and also shift in his mentality. Where he begins in Phantom Menace, and he's like, ah, oh, another pathetic life form master. Like, I'm, I'm too busy with my studies as a Jedi. I want to pass the test. Like, oh, my master is dead. Now I have to bear this responsibility on my shoulders. And he's suddenly hit with this, you know, cold reality that his master is no longer there. This, this kid is his charge now. And how he transforms in episode two and episode three. It was just, in general, very, very beautiful transformation. I loved so yeah, to answer your question, very winded, long question, is that I saw more of Ewan McGregor, McGregor doing the character. But moving on, my next set of characters I want to talk about are, <laughs> not even how to launch this, Jar Jar Binks, Boss Nas, and the Gungans. What the heck is going on there? Are they comedic relief? What is the intention behind that very heavy, heavy accent? And what does it do for Phantom Menace and the rest of the films? Hmm. now i will say that i every time i watch the phantom menace i enjoy the movie more i find more things to like about it but i despise jar jar more every single time now i am in no way saying i have got anything against riz ahmed i think he's a very talented individual um for what he actually brought to screen with jar jar and the fact it was the first fully animated character ever right um like in a live action performance and things that was such a main character so front kudos to him and i'm really sorry that he went through so much hardship where after phantom Menace came out and everyone just hated on him right and he didn't do anything for a long time at least now he's got a bit of a resurgence with you know jedi temple and sort of other things um but his voice is very jarring and jar jarring it basically it cuts through you you know and whenever you hear it whenever anyone hears it like if i'm ever chatting with the guys or anything um, any of my friends someone will occasionally get on their phone and get jar jar saying something as a, like a joke because they know i despise it and anytime you hear his voice in any setting it cuts through everything it, it's like a knife but not in like an ice knife or like anything or shrill necessarily it kind of is but his voice is nasally but it's also high pitched but he also repeats things and says things in silly ways, but not in a way that I view as like culturally appropriate in a sense of, you know, if, you, if you're if you young and you hear someone speak in a certain accent, you go, oh, they speak different to me. You know, Jar Jar's not that. Jar Jar is, hey, let's, let's do normal speaking and let's intentionally change words to make them only more annoying for no other reason. You know, you can speak full English, but there's these few words he just says it annoyingly. And so I think that if George Lucas's intention was to annoy the hell out of every adult, success if his intention was to do a comic relief character that's beloved you have failed because his voice is so frustratingly annoying and i think i think lucas kind of understood that to a degree and i know that especially in later star wars in the clone wars in particular even though i don't like the jar jar episodes in the clone wars because I, I despise jar jar really the, yeah the um the episodes with mace windu are actually quite good because i really like the balance of how much mace windu hates him and, and whenever anyone interacts with jar jar apart from padme they are always like oh my god why are you here i hate you and then he does something and you're like oh, you were actually kind of helpful in this scenario like mace windu's begrudgingly giving him uh praise in that clone wars arc where he gets with that duck woman thing which is a very bizarre episode but Jar Jar's voice, I think, if we look at it as intentionally trying to be annoying, it hit all the marks. It's it's so jarring, cuts through things. Yeah. And then Bosnars, he's voiced by Brian Blessed. And obviously, I knew uh, Blessed from Black Adder, and he's been in hundreds of roles. But he's got the big, booming, authority voice. You know, if he's speaking in a room, no one else can talk. His voice is booming over everyone else's. Mm -hmm. And Bosnars is, it does do that. It's got the annoying silliness that I really don't like where he shakes his face and it's that... Mur, mur, mur. Uh, if they removed that, it would have worked so much better. But I think it's kind of trying to... That sort of mannerism is trying to show almost that he's he's authoritative and stuff, but trying to indicate he's not the smartest, I, I think. Right, that's how right, I interpret right. It. Because Qui-Gon very easily you know, uses the Force and mind tricks him. And we've already seen by that point, you can't mind trick Watto um wait is that no that's not 
Yeah, that's Tatooine is after, isn't it? I'm getting Tatooine really is, I believe, after. Yeah, for good because the first the landing, right? Landing on uh, Naboo. Yes, that's and it. then Tatooine is, is after. Right, exactly. So at that point in Star Wars, we'd only known that you can't mind trick Jabba because obviously right. that was in uh, Return of the Jedi. And at that point, you didn't get anything. And then you know a little bit later on, you get Watto, who can't be mind tricked. Obviously, Watto is intelligent. He's a bit of a horrible character in a lot of ways, but he's intelligent. Right. And with Boss Nass, I think the idea is that he is authoritative but he's not that smart and i think the mouth shaking bit kind of ele- tries to show that in some ways that and he's then, unrefined perhaps yeah in some ways and then i think that and it kind of balances out brian blessed's usual booming voice and whatnot and then when you compare it to other gungans like i think the only other gungans that have any major speaking roles is captain tarples who's the main one who's with jar jar during the mm-hmm. battle on nabu where they fight all the the battle droids and he speaks in a lot less of a silly way. He's a lower voice. Right. He still has the same mannerisms of Jar Jar in the sense of saying me, sir, and you, sir, mm-hmm. and those sort of things. But he's he hasn't got that air of silliness to it. His voice hasn't got the nasally high-pitched annoyance to it. And so right. I think the way that the sort of the three, if you compare them, you've got Tarpo is the standard. You've got Boss Nass, who is technically a side species because the Gungans are split into two species. There's the species that Boss Nass is, which is the bigger ones that are more green. And then you've got the ones that uh, Tarpo is. I didn't know that. Is. Yeah, that's why they look so different because mm-hmm. that the beaks shape is different and the ear flaps right. and whatnot. I can't remember what the different, what the two species are called, but they are a subspecies of Gungans. Mm-hmm. And so I think with the three of them together, Tarples represents the everyman Gungan, the standard way Gungans are. And I think when you compare that to the, the two of Boss Nass and Jar Jar, it really shows what Jar Jar and Boss Nass are really like in that way. That, you know, mm-hmm. Jar Jar is this fool. He's annoying. No one likes him. Everyone's always trying to get rid of him in the film. You know, Obi- Obi-Wan wants to get rid of him. The Gungans kick him out. Anytime he's introduced, everyone's like, oh, Jar Jar. <laughs> Whereas Boss Nass is like, yeah, you're the leader of this place but you have to be mind tricked to make the right decision right at the end of it yeah you you kind of it shows that boss nasa's whole thing was he thought that the naboo looked down on him and i think that was trying and obviously then eventually he realized padme bows to him and then he accepts the alliance and whatnot and i think that was kind of trying to show that maybe just because someone does speak differently it doesn't make them less intelligent but the problem is is that george completely counteracts that with a mind trick thing so my whole views on Boss Nass, my theory, completely falls apart because George Lucas kind of undoes it a little bit. I got something to add to that. Works. Please do. Um, I remember watching The Phantom Menace and, you know, it's completely, the trailer just blew my mind. I, I was so excited for it. I didn't mind the fact that, okay, I'm going to go in, I'm going to know who this actor is, I'm going to know who the villain is because we all knew the Emperor, blah, blah, blah. I was super excited. And to this day, I still believe that the prequels represent a hidden gem of George Lucas's ideas, a lot of which were executed flawlessly in the Clone Wars show. And that is why I absolutely love every single episode, including Jar Jar Binks episodes. I love him as a character in the Clone Wars series. Um, when I was watching it, and I was kind of like separating my huge disappointment from what George Lucas was trying to tell, I really found Naboo to be very, very compelling because he's showing you these two different cultures trying to coexist together in a moment of major strife. And if Amidala and Naboo, the royal crown, represent this, you know, refinement and intelligence and artistry, then these are Gungans who are, for lack of a better term, is the primitive culture. Hmm. And just because he is being, you can manipulate him mentally that he's weaker minded it doesn't give you power or authority over them and i think that's a beautiful message It's like yeah okay he is more primitive and they do fight with spears and they have these you know energy shields and stuff like that but they proved to be resourceful they proved a major force to aid queen uh, amidala in in you know liberating abu so they, they show up for themselves and they deliver major major things in that film but what I dislike about Jar Jar's ex- again, Jar Jar's character never pissed me off, but he did interrupt my viewing of the film. Not him, George Lucas, because a man who created the original trilogy, which every shot, every scene works like this in concert with one another. Here you have these goofy, silly Warner Brothers Looney Tune caricatures populating a live action film. And I don't mean the fact that they are CGI characters. 
you can have a CGI character work very well next to a live actor. The Planet of the Apes movies are a testament to that. Especially the last one. Remember the, the funny ape, the ooh one? He's funny one moment in a very precise way, and then he's tragic in the next moment, and you sympathize with him. Not with Jar Jar. He's a caricature of a character. And for a director to be able to greenlight that and say, yeah, yeah, that's fine. That satisfies me. It almost shows his inability to extract from the actor what he needs. He's like, no, that's going to be fine. More intense, more action, run faster, let's go. It's it's great storyteller, maybe not the best director. Same with Boss Nas, the whole blah, 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 antics. It just immediately interrupts the film. It stops you enjoying the movie. I'm like, why is this here? Why is it done in this, this specific way? Intellectually, I can appreciate Gungans. That's why I kind of like summed them up in this one bulky part of the conversation so you and I could toss it around but not the execution it leaves so much and it all begins before the prequels it begins in the special editions of Star Wars and you see this stupid ass character in the return of the Jedi doing a musical number that it doesn't jive with the rest of the film aesthetic of the return of the Jedi like what are you doing here is this really an improvement it's just it was it was very frustrating moment with me that I had my grievances with George Lucas specifically. But now moving away a little bit, because we have still more stuff to cover from the Gungans to Nemodians. Viceroy Gun Ray, their very specific garments, which kind of give us an idea what real world culture to associate it with. Mm. But I also want you to speak to their accent and yeah, speak to their accent and then I'll kind of bring it home. What's going on with them? So when we spoke about this last time, I did bring my thoughts onto it. So I'll give this more of a brief, less rambly version. But right. When I first watched it, I was like, oh, there's these characters that, you know, he's basically a bad person. I mean, I had to watch it about five or six times to understand what the hell was going on with him. Because when you're an, you know, when you're a, like an eight-year-old watching Phantom Menace, you have no idea what trade disputes are, barely understand what a blockade is. And then you watch, you go, oh, there's a blockade. And then it zooms out of the planet and there's like one ship there. And then Obi-Wan and their ship managed to get off really easily. Obviously, R2 saves them, but still. And you're just like, is I thought a blockade was a, a like a wall, but it's not. Ignoring those sort of story elements of, you know, even friends of mine who watch this, so I don't know what happens in The Phantom Menace. It's like, it makes sense eventually <laughs> after many watches. <laughs> but with New Gunray in particular, when I first watched it, I was like, oh, it's a character, it's a baddie, whatever. Then as I've gotten older, something that is highlighted to me, and I highlighted this in our last conversation, that I... I, I probably agree with the stance, but I feel like I have to kind of highlight it just in case of just like a lot of people interpret this to be racially insensitive because it's from the argument I have heard is that it is a, stereo, a negative stereotypical accent of people from Asia. I believe the Chinese accent is the one that is highlighted the most as being right. uh, the one it's compared to and insensitive. And although I didn't get that when I watched it, watching it as older, but more so when people have pointed it out to me, I understand that uh, perspective. I understand where people are coming from with that. For me, I'm not from that culture. I would, I can't get secondhand offended for them. So I can't speak to that element, but I want to highlight that that is a part of it. And right. I know that when we spoke before, you didn't interpret that. And I want to know what your thoughts are on that specifically. And also, I'm sure you've got a note for this, how that links in with Watto because that stereotype, it links in a bit more with your culture. So I kind of, I'm really interested to hear your thoughts on the Moidian side, but also how that connects in with the Watto's sort of accent. Mm -hmm. So I'll bring it in with Watto just uh, in a bit, but first I got to say that the reason that uh, Nemodians didn't work for me was a big part of it was their, the visuals. Mm. Uh, they, they, they weren't convincing as the antagonists in the story to me. They look silly. They look stupid to me. They look like, I can't be convinced that these guys are a threat. Mm -hmm. Now, the one who's pulling all the strings, and maybe partially it's the alien character design, partially it's the Confederacy or the embargo from the Nemodians Trade Federation. Like, Trade Federations? I'm here to see a war movie. Like, what the hell is going on with Federations? Partially it's that, partially it's the story, visual aesthetic, and then the accents are, once again, are disruptive. These guys are not supposed... Obviously, they're supposed to look like they're in shadow of this grand manipulator by Palpatine. They are in service of some, someone else. They're a tool. I get that. 
but you don't need to make them idiots to make the other guys smart, right? They they, they need to be henchmen. They need to be effective henchmen. Remember the, the henchmen in the, the Lord of the Rings, the one that whispers into the king's ear mm. and corrupts his mind in the ages. I forget the character's name. Well, been, I think so. It's been so many years, but that is a snake for you. As a guy who's intimidating, threatening, not in the physical way, but anyway, it's like, oh my God, what a snake. I want to choke this guy. I want to kill him. He's so bad. He's evil. He just, mm, he makes you like so nervous, but not in the emotions. It just looks stupid and silly. I think that now I'm going to bring it in with Watso, who obviously has this Russian accent. And I'm going to say it as a Russian Jew. I think I have the ticket to say that he looks like a Russian Jew with that little hat, with the little vest, which was a very a stereotypical post uh, Russian revolution, kind of like Ukrainian or Eastern Russian Jewish uh, jeweler or something like that. If the vest is, is a big, big part of it. I've heard that criticism. I right. don't know enough about Russian culture. It's not a criticism that, to me at all. I think racial stereotypes are fine, even though we're living in this uh, apologetic cancer culture where everything offends everyone. This movie was made 20 years ago. We laughed at stuff like this, like, oh, ha, ha, ha. That's what he's supposed to be. It's okay when it's done not maliciously. And I don't believe George Lucas is a malicious person. We all know who his wife is, right? He is a, a, a very spiritual person. He's a very self-assured person. He was doing it to accent. He's like, hey, this is this stereotype. This is that stereotype. Just have fun. Watch this movie and have a blast. He's not being malicious. He's not belittling people. He's just showing you a fantastical world where people talk funny. Big deal. Every time, like, we have either a podcast or something, or I talk to somebody, I talk like one. I was like, oh, what are you talking about? It's, it's freaking funny. Have a laugh at it. What, what is there to be offended about? At the end of the day, he's actually, for me, one of the more likable characters about the prequels. Mm -hmm. Remember how he comes around in the Attack of the Clones? He's like, Annie? Is that you? And he's generally surprised. He's like, hey, I kind of sold her. It's like, hey, he's like so miserable in, with the lot in life that he was given of being this little henchman slash like this scrapyard owner. He wasn't holding Anakin on a leash. Yes, he was a slave owner, but not the type of guy who's going to like crack a whip at you. And when Anakin was there, he helped him. So I can't see it as a negative stereotype. I can't see it as something that is belittling or demeaning Russian culture. I'm like, or maybe I'm just not from that generation. Maybe my, my skin is tougher. I don't know. It's, I find him adorable. That little, especially when they start bargaining and Qui-Gon Jinn needs to do this. I'm like, yes, we're smart. My people are smart. <laughs> you can't use the mind trick. And he's like, the tricks don't work on me. I know, like, I'm super exaggerating. I'm not hitting the bar how water talks, but still, I'm thinking It's still that, pretty good. It's still yeah? pretty good. <laughs> Republic credits are no good here. It's It's good. It's textural. It, it kind of gives you an identity that can you can associate with. It's fun stuff. But the reason that I wanted to start with uh, Gungans, move to the Emodians, because I want to now compare it to all other specific accents. And I think the sequence that we're doing it in perhaps might give you a couple of ideas. Uh, if you guys are hearing a little bit of a hello in the background there. It's, I don't think we ever had a successful podcast without some honking. But anyway... Now to move away from these, a lot of these alien species, with, which either you and I found caricature-like and not very convincing, let's talk about something else, which I felt was quite a polar opposite. We had Captain Gregor Typho, performed by Jay Lagaya, who is an actor and singer from his New Zealand and Australian background. You had, of course, the great Tamara Morrison, who portrays Django Fett. You had Daniel Logan, who portrays young Boba Fett, both actors are from New Zealand. Now, moving away from accents hidden behind prosthetics and alien designs to human characters, which are instantly more relatable and identifiable as people of ethnic culture. Talk to me about those. What, what impression did they make on you in the Attack of the Clones and beyond? Like, what, what is, was their imprint on the film? In all honesty, when I saw um, when I saw Tython and uh, when I saw some of the other characters that were portrayed by people of color, I just I was like, oh, these are just people in the universe talking. They sound a smidge different to everyone else. They don't sound any more intelligent. They don't sound any less intelligent. I just quite liked the variety of accents in a way that, as I said, even when I watched it as a kid, when I hear Watto or the Nemoidians or anything like that, 
their accents don't specifically take me out of the movie. Jar Jar's mm-hmm. constant interruptions that ruin the whole flow of the movie. That takes me out of the movie. But I like that even when you hear an accent that when I, this is my perspective, I'm, I want to clarify, not trying to be racially insensitive to anyone who may or may not be offended by these things. But for me, when I watched it, I was just like, there are some people or some beings that talk like that. So like the more right. audience for me, when I watch it, I go, there's people in that that sounds like that. You know, it's not impossible to think that an alien who is trying to speak galactic basic would sound like that same with Watto. you know galactic basic is the language that you know it's the majority of the universe speak but everyone's got their own uh way of doing it and obviously as being an english native speaker and being right. someone who is english as well when i hear people like i'm very used to hearing people speak in air quotes my language in a variety of different ways because i think english is probably the most it's not the most spoken about language for humans because i think chinese mandarin uh is the number one language and i think Mm -hmm. spanish has the most amount of speakers in the most amount of countries i think there's Mm -hmm. the second language or something but it's like english chinese mandarin and uh spanish i think are the three main languages that are the most commonly spoken across the, the world so being an english speaker and hearing loads of people speak english in different ways in my own life, I live in Southampton, um, which is a, uh, a boiling pot of uh, cultures. We're a, we have a big dock, so I hear people of all different nationalities speaking English and whatnot. So when I go into Star Wars, and when I want to hear all these people. I'm just like, oh, this is cool. So you've got some people who say it in a, in a, in a much more obvious way that they have a clear accent, that they speak, they sound very different. And then you get characters like, you know, Jango Fett, which is just, he has a slight, I'm going to use the word again, twang. It's just, Mm -hmm. oh, he doesn't speak the same as Obi-Wan speaks. He doesn't speak the same as other standard British or even American characters speak. He just says the same general words, but in a slightly different way. And for me watching that, I just go, just like in this world, you know, it, it makes me go, oh yeah, people can say the same things and say it slightly differently, but it's still the meaning is the same. And for me, that just made the whole galaxy feel wider. Every character I meet in Star Wars that speaks with a slightly different accent or right. speaks in a way I haven't heard and have to bring subtitles up like um, Greedo in uh, A New Hope or Jabba, you know, whenever you get these characters, whether they're speaking in a different language or they're speaking galactic basic, I just, the more accents for me, the better because it widens the scope of the universe. And that's, that's the main thing about Star Wars I love is being immersed in the universe. And all I think whenever I hear other people's accents is it just adds to that. Yeah. You know, when I saw Tamara Morrison in uh, um, Attack of the Clones, which I, I instantly enjoyed that movie a great deal better than The Phantom Menace. Mm-hmm. And a huge part of it was the duel between Django and Kenobi, but also just mm-hmm. Tamara Morrison's performance throughout. Even their exchange is like, have you been across to Coruscant, that little scene there, and young Boba is like looking so gangster, he's like, who the hell is this guy? I better go hide the armor. He's like, he gives off such great performance in that short amount of space. Those two actors for me did perform a task well outside of that film. Because when I started reading about the Mandalorians, and especially Karen Travis, the writer who, she wrote Mandalorians in the way that we have not seen before. Tamara Morris and Daniel Logan, they gave me a cultural identity of Mandalorians. We obviously know from Star Wars Legends that Mandalorians are not a specific race of people, not a specific species. You could be different species who are part of the creed. Mm -hmm. But I don't know why, maybe it's just me. Every time I think of Mandalorians, I think of that Samoan on a Polynesian kind of descent. Mm -hmm. I don't know, there's something so beautifully exotic. I I also uh, looked at... Um, I watched uh, a movie which came around the same time as uh, Phantom Menace. Actually, the actress from that movie, The Whale Rider, Hmm. she plays the young um, uh, woman in uh, The Phantom Menace and also, I believe, in Rage of the Sith. She's one of the ones who follows uh, Padme's coffin. Right, right. So she's the lead actress also, and they portray the Maori people in a movie called Whale Rider. And it's her performance in a movie that doesn't, you know, has nothing to do with Star Wars, but also Tom Moira and Daniel Logan. They just gave me this exotic, specific cultural identity that lives inside of Star Wars. And I'm, every time I see that look, I say, ah, these are Mandalorians. Every time I look at Mandalorians in the Clone Wars show, I'm thinking, ah, so they probably look like this behind the mask. You see what I'm trying to say? Mm, so it was such yeah. a beautiful moment for me where both the visual appearance of the actors plus their accents 
created sparked just a web of imagination in my mind personally and they just did yeah. a beautiful service to the diversity in that in uh, star wars in general yeah i think you're right and with the sort of polynesian cultures and maui and things like that i think of you know often i think of tattoos you think of their slightly more darker skin mm -hmm. i also think of warriors i do not think of people who easily get pushed around i exactly. think of, you know, although i am not familiar with the whole history of their cultures and things but i do think of, of warriors and when i think of A those proud things, people yeah exactly <clears throat> proud you've got the traditions you've got the strength of them but also the connection there and you know weirdly enough and I've only just thought of this. Django Fett and Boba Fett have a closer family connection than almost anyone in Star Wars. You don't, you, Star Wars, a lot of it is about found family. It's about who, yeah. you, you know, Rebels, I think specifically does an excellent job of this, of who you choose to surround yourself with becomes your family. Mm -hmm. But in, especially the prequels, you don't have that. You've got the Jedi Order, which is this air quotes, crazy religion. And then you've got like, other characters that just kind of get wrapped up in the politics of the universe at large and then a lot of them get killed in the war and after but when you have Django Boba you really get that he's in it for a son you know he's a bounty hunter he's one of the most famous bounty hunters there are he makes a ridiculous amount of money from giving his uh, DNA to the Kaminoans to make uh, the clone army but the thing he wanted the most was an unaltered clone a son without having to be in a relationship with someone go through that he just wanted a ward he wanted a legacy he mm -hmm. wanted someone to carry on the torch of what makes him him and for him it's being a bounty hunter and you still get it with that moment and said so with daniel logan like such a brilliant actor at such a young age when you see him he's got the the snide look the sort of the cruelty especially when obi-wan's chasing them through the uh, asteroid belt of geonosis and he's like get him dad get him and that, that sort of thing and he does that little smug laugh and then right near the end you get that somber moment when Django gets beheaded by uh, Mace and then all the Jedi have just bailed out of the arena. And all that's left is the corpses. Yeah. And you just get Boba Fett walk up and pick up the helmet and just puts his head to it. And it's like, that's a really touching moment for a villain. For mm -hmm. like someone who is, you know, becomes a, a villain in the original trilogy and someone who was, you know... Although I don't think that Jango Fett was evil, he obviously worked for bad people. That's kind of bounty hunters right. are meant to be morally gray. You know, they're not mm -hmm. good, they're not bad. They're kind of bad because they kill for money, generally speaking, <laughs> but they're not explicitly bad people. They're not yeah. evil. And so it's just so odd that in, in the Attack of the Clones, you get the closest thing to family in two characters that are really side characters that are just kind of a, almost a plot device, but are some of the most important characters in the Star Wars galaxy. And it's just very interesting that you get that and them both being from New Zealand and having the, very, for lack of a better word, the exotic accent. It's not that exotic, but you know what I mean? The different to the norm accent. And me associating it with warrior culture and family and those sort of things. And then having the two actors who are the only thing we really see as family in the prequels. Because you don't really get brothers or anything. You they yeah. call each other, the, the Jedi call each other brothers and the father figures and that. But it's always the the figures the he's like my father he's like my brother you know not the actually by blood the only time you see that is the twins obviously leia and luke mm -hmm. so it's very interesting having that connection i'm not sure if that was intentional but now i'm thinking about that's it a very time. interesting observation um moving a little bit back to american accents i mm -hmm. want to cheat a little bit here because we were trying to kind of stay within the parameters of talking about the prequel trilogy but let's bring the clone wars show in here as well so we had Samuel Jackson portray Mace Windu in the films, and we had Terrence Carson portray him in the Clone Wars show. Both are American actors, both bring similar or same kind of accent, which is, I mean, it's kind of arguable because depending on where you move about the US, right, people are still talking with a different kind of like way. Just like when you go across a large area, you spoke about it. But uh, Great Britain, I spoke about it, Russia, depending where you move in the territory, the language is the same, but the mannerism, the way people talk is different. I want to see what was the experience of the Mace Windu's character through Samuel Jackson versus Terrence Carson in the Clone Wars show. Hmm. Um, in all honesty, I barely noticed the difference, if I'm completely honest with you. It was one of the things with Clone Wars that I liked the most is that, you know... Excluding the movie, because obviously, uh, I think in the movie you still had, uh, you had uh, Christopher Lee still voicing um, Count Dooku. And I think Mace, I think Samuel L. Jackson did Mace Windu as well, just in the movie of Clone mm. Wars. Uh, but then the series, obviously, both of those actors do change. 
there are very few actors really that in the Clone Wars, like when me and Megan, when I showed it to her, she was like, is that you and McGregor's Obi-Wan? I was like, no. And she was like, oh, now you've said no, I can kind of hear it. I was like, that's not Hayden Christensen as Anakin, mm-hmm. is it? No, 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 it's not. Is that, you know, it was, you get the gist. At almost every character she actually had to ask, because like, is that the original voice actor? And I was like, the only one, to my knowledge, I think was uh, Frank Oz as Yoda, I think. I think pretty much everyone else was, apart from really small characters. Right. And so with the change, I didn't necessarily find any real, any s- substantial difference. Uh, so with with you, that's kind of a cop out question, a cop out answer. But with yourself, did you find there was much of a, a difference between them? Yeah, tremendous difference. Um, oh, okay, interesting. Yeah, it's first of all, it's to me the Clone Wars uh, represented the resurgence of Star Wars. If mm-hmm. you know, I walked off from Revenge of the Sith, and it was still kind of was still nitpicking. It was like, oh, I wish this was better. I wish that part was a little better. But what was I satisfied? I was like, damn right, I was satisfied. I was like. Yeah, this one feels the closest to Star Wars. This is the best we're going to get ever, right? Because George is not making any more Star Wars. Then are you happy? Are you happy? Are you going to really complain? Yes, I'm happy. I I walked away from that movie happy, especially the last 15 minutes of that film. Just When I heard the music in the Obi-Wan Kenobi show, I literally almost burst out like crying. Mm -hmm. I, I did not anticipate to act like that at all, man. I was like, do all of I'm telling you, there. I, I, it was a beautiful moment. Too bad there was nobody of my friends or family to witness it. I, I was genuinely shook. I'm like, oh my god, I'm a closet prequel fan. Um, but anyway, <laughs> um, I never. Sam Jackson is an amazing actor. I love yeah. him in everything that he does. The energy, the charisma, the Nick Fury, whatever it is he does, what he touches is gold. I never liked him in Star Wars. Okay. Uh, nothing to do with his talent. I love the guy. I'm telling you. Like, he's one of my favorite actors. He's so well known. And the character, especially in The Phantom Menace, is nothing but this just demeaning, pompous, arrogant politician within the Jedi Order. That's all he does. And he's nagging Anakin throughout the trilogy. He's like, do this, do that. Oh, we're the good guys, but I'm just going to chop this bounty onto his head in front of his kid. It, maybe it's the character. Maybe it's the way that George portrayed him. And maybe because Sam Jackson was too much of an established actor. You know, looking at, at other recent actors who I wish I would have substituted, I constantly bring back the actor from the Gladiator film. Remember that the African actor, I keep forgetting his name, such a wonderful, he has that exotic look and feel about him, that musk, like the musculature, the frame, the way that he carries himself, the thick, heavy African accent. I'm like, oh my God, if he would have been uh, uh, Mace Pundu, it would have been a completely different read of the character. And now we enter into Clone Wars, and you know, with the first episode, I'm like, ah oh, man, I don't know if I'm going to like any more of that Clone War period kind of storytelling. That was immediately hooked from the first episode. I'm like, gee, now I wonder, are we going to see cameos from prequels? Are, we, are they going to stop dropping other characters? Or is it just going to be Anakin, Kenobi, and entirely new cast? We never knew what's going to happen. The moment that Mace Windu shows up on the screen, two things happen. I learned to absolutely love the artistic style of the Clone Wars. I showed it to my father recently. I was like, how is it done? Is it claymation i said no that's cgi he couldn't even tell to him mm. me being like a russian kid we have a very famous famous school of of uh, uh, animation claymation is widely used there so i'm mm. looking at this a it looks stylistically beautiful and b when mace window starts talking and a kind of story that spreads on the canvas of the entire clone Wars series what he does in the show how he looks like how he carries himself he exemplifies that exoticism that i was looking in the live action films which unfortunately was diminished by the popularity of, of sam jackson mm. so i'm there yeah. i'm one of the fans who's like oh no it's like too popular too known too famous and then terence carson completely turned around the character for me and i i fell in love with him um just i looked up gladiator i, I believe the actor's name is uh jimon hunsu he's mm-hmm. in mm-hmm. um a, a lot of people who are blonde diamond uh, gladiator yep. Guys of the Galaxy, he's even in that as mm-hmm. well. Um, Fantastic actor. 
yeah, he is, he's phenomenal. He's, he's a brilliant actor. Um, I, that's a very interesting perspective that you said. And it's funny because uh, Mace Windu as a character, I, when I was young, I was like, he's the most badass because he kills the most people. No, he never loses a duel in the films. You know, Phantom Messi does nothing. But obviously in, um, in Attack of the Clones, he completely decimates Django and, and Obi-Wan couldn't really even beat Django. And then you get in the uh, Revenge of the Sith. He's the only person who can beat Palpatine. Even Yoda loses against him. So I was like, oh my God, Mace Windu is so badass. And then when you watch it now, she's like, no, Ace Windu, he, he's a dick. <laughs> like, he's Megan's <laughs> yeah, least favorite character. <laughs> Meg, Megan's least favorite character, aside he from the, the whininess of Anakin, is Mace Windu. Because she's like, he's the reason that Anakin went to the Dark Side. He's one of the main reasons. It's his fault for pushing Anakin away. And why didn't he trust Anakin? And then you watch the Clone Wars and she's like, it's even worse than the Clone Wars. <laughs> she's, he's even worse to him. So it's one of those funny things where, just as a character, he is, he is kind of what's almost representing somewhat what's wrong with the jedi the yeah. dogmatic view of it the mm -hmm. very sternness of him and the lacking of he's very he's very rigid he won't you know change and then there's that really weird line in attack of the clones which is um perhaps we should tell uh the republic that we're losing our connection to the force and then you're just like yes and then it just never gets brought up ever again it's like okay so that, <laughs> that happened? very bizarre um but it's very interesting you say that point i mean with the clone wars i found that i mean I am not like you with the Clone Wars at all. I love the Clone Wars. I think Clone Wars is brilliant. I think Rebels is better. Soz. I think Clone Wars has some top tier moments that are basically unbeatable. Series seven, especially the, the last few episodes. Right. The last four episodes of that, I think is some of the greatest Star Wars ever made ever. It's yeah. good enough to be its own movie. But series one of Clone Wars did not grab me at all. It was a mm. slog and a half. There's only, for me personally, I think there's only about six good episodes in series one. You could just cut the rest of that. Um, but we're not talking about the animated shows, but that could be another podcast we could do. <laughs> um, yeah, with with the uh, accents though, it's it's not something I've really considered with Mace Windu. I think it is because Samuel Jackson was so established. I mean, even by then, yeah. I knew who Mace, who uh, Samuel huge. Jackson was. Yeah. I mean, I, I don't, I can't remember when I watched Pulp Fiction compared to Star Wars. I, I'm fairly certain I watched Star Wars first, but I know I remember watching Pulp Fiction and there was a point where I just remembered Samuel Jackson primarily as Jules from Pulp Fiction and Mace Windu from Star Wars. <laughs> Two very different roles. Um, but he is such a big actor. It does in some ways take away from it. And I think that one of the things that I liked so much about Star Wars especially is that, and I'm glad they did this in the sequel trilogy, um, is that the main cast are generally unknown. Yeah. You know, they're not, you know, obviously we discussed Liam Neeson and Hugh McGregor. Liam Neeson was a lot more established. Samuel Jackson was probably the most established. And then Hugh McGregor's in a few things, obviously he was in Train Spotting and Shallow Grave and Moulin Rouge. But mm -hmm. aside from those sort of roles, he was becoming a breakthrough actor when he was sort of in Star Wars and that kind of cemented him. Um, so I really like that. And I think that especially with something that is fantasy, and they did this with Game of Thrones for the most part as well, you need one or two big names to really help hold the big roles, the really carry the picture, draw yeah. people in. Mm -hmm. Yeah, you get Alec Guinness and um, Peter Cushion to draw people in, and then you get the new the cast of people who you've never really seen in much before. So you only see them as the character. Obviously, these with Harry Potter as well. Most of the big fantasy uh, greats, Lord of the Rings, Harry Potter, those sort of things. Most of the main characters, apart from like one or two, are normally unknown people, and I think that really works when you've got fantasy. And obviously, Star Wars is space fantasy first, right? Sci-fi second. It's primarily a space fantasy. And so when you have that, you want to be immersed in the world. And to be immersed in the world, you need diversity, you need believability, and you need, when you get absor absorbed in, you can't just look at an actor and be like, that's not the character of Mace Windu, that's the actor, Samuel Jackson. Right. So right. the way you put it there, I think that, you know, Samuel Jackson's great, but he didn't put an accent on, he just spoke mm -hmm. as he kind of normally does, just very slow. <laughs> so right. it does take you out a bit. Uh, Mike, before we bring this home, um, I have two bonus questions for us. We can't leave this podcast without talking about revenge of the sith and you know we have primarily the same cast from the first two movies going into this we kind of discussed them so in a way we did bring the revenge of the sith into this discussion but there's two specific points that i wanted to get your thoughts on chancellor palpatine becomes the emperor in this film it is his biggest transformation if he was doing his little emperor shenanigans in the previous two movies here he has, you know, the cocoon opens and a butterfly, he spreads his wings, he becomes the emperor. Not only it's two different voices behind him, and he's very, he's a theatrically trained professional actor, but there's also two distinct 
performances that he gives, like physical performances. Talk about that a little bit. What what is happening there with Pal- Chancellor Palpatine and his transformation into the Emperor? Was it successful? Did those two distinct voice accents and performances convince you of the, his journey from, from becoming this face of goodness to a totalitarian you know, leader? It's kind of hard because Palpatine is the the worst plot twist in the history of cinema on the basis that no one, unless you're like an eight-year-old or if you've never seen Star Wars before, no yeah. one was surprised. Like they have the same actor. And when he's in this little hood, his chin is the only chin in Star Wars that looks like that. So even <laughs> when the Phantom Menace, where you see, you know, the serious hood is like, yeah, you've done well. It's like, well, you can see he's got the little dot chin and he's the only character who looks like that. Yeah. So even for the first film you go, that's the same person. So it's one of those things. It's the worst kept secret in Star Wars. It's even when Megan watched it for the first time. And I showed her in order from one uh, up to one to six, even though she'd seen bits and pieces of it before. And she was literally, she was like, but they played the baddie music when he comes on screen. So you know, he's like in, um, I can't remember if it's in Phantom Menace or Attack of the Clones, but like the Imperial March, like a variation of the Imperial March. Mm-hmm. Right. I think like plays at some point, like a couple of notes from it. Mm-hmm. And as soon as that happens, she's like, he's a baddie, just straight away. So, you know, and it's definitely pretty obvious the whole time. I think Ian McDermott did a good job, but this is the problem with prequels when you have to retroactively put someone in a position because Mm -hmm. the the end goal, he had to sound like he did in episode six. That was the problem. So all they had to do is basically go, let's get this actor and he has to try and not sound the way he did when he originally did this role 30 odd years ago. Well, uh, it was 82, 83 to 99. So yeah, about nearly 20 years. So the problem is when you've got, you know, the emperor's voice, which is very much, um, it's slow. It kind of drags in, in not in a bad way. In like, it, it feels like it drags on the floor, like a really right. subtle nails on a chalkboard sort of thing. Well, it's doing this and it just drags across things. You know, um, you have done well, my apprentice. That sort of thing. Whereas Palpatine doesn't talk like that when he's, the senator he talks much more well spoken like a career politician and he speaks he's very a lot more like that yeah mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. and he's got the calming it's the smoothness to the roughness i think right. so he does he does do the change well um i just i need to put this in there as well is the worst part in the revenge of the sith is the no bit from not well actually the two both no bits in revenge of the sith are the two worst bits the main one i was gonna say is when palpatine gets no 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 mm-hmm. you will die it's like okay you could have cut off all of those no's and he just said it once that would have been fine and also the no and vader at the end of revenge of the sith is awful i want to clarify that ruins bits of it but with palpatine his voice in itself i think he did a great job of changing it but it's so hard because although I do feel like it does work for each of the characters, because they had to do it backwards, when you get when you get Palpatine when he becomes the Emperor, when he actually has that voice, it's quite weird because it's got the dragginess to it and the, the kind of um, lack of effort. But you'd think it's it would be the opposite because you'd think it'd be that sort of the more Brian Blessed side. The big, the loud, the booming, he's one. And you get that a little bit when um, when he's in the Senate towards the end, uh, when he says it's going to get re uh, reorganized into the Galactic Empire, and then everyone cheers and whatever. When that happens, you do get a bit, you do get a bit of that power. But I, I do, I'm kind of thinking as I speak. I wonder if part of it is kind of like he's so powerful and he's so beyond any comprehension of any other character. Mm-hmm. He doesn't even really need to put the effort into speak. So it's almost like yeah. him vocalizing whatever he's thinking. He's putting in such a little amount of effort and he's so not enthused by it. He just talks like this. Oh, that's the an time. excellent point. Yeah. I wonder if that's it, but I, 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 it's kind of weird. I have a very, it's a big, as you could hear by that ramble, I've got lots of varying, right. not fully thought out thoughts. So I, I'd love to hear your opinion on uh, Palpatine's change because I'll say I, I'm a pretty cool shill, whereas you're a bit more uh, critical of it. First of all, Ian McDiarmid, you know, f- tremendous, fantastic. I think he's one of the yeah. greatest actors to grace this franchise. Mm-hmm. Um, I was, on the bigger part, disappointed with what was done with his character than not. And it has very little to do with the revelation of knowing who he is. Um, he is more successful when he's Chancellor Palpatine. 
But even then, when he talks, it almost feels like the lines of the dialogue and how the actor is made to perform those lines, it almost talks down to you like an idiot or a child. That's the argument there. It's like, was it really made for children? Because why would you have all these amounts of politics and trade negotiations and this and that? Is it really for kids? Because every time he talks to Anakin, he also talks down to the audience. It's like, are we stupid? We know what he's doing with him. It needs to be more nuanced. It needs to deliver. It needs to be more layered. We have a giant, a, a titan of acting in front of you. And he can do all of this stuff. And I felt that almost in every opportunity where George Lucas had the chance to do the right take, he chose the wrong take and he put it in the movie. And that is particularly a glaring issue when he transforms into uh, the emperor. The emperor, like you, you, you just gave form to what I was thinking when you describe his voice in the original trilogy. He's so powerful. He doesn't need, even need to put effort in where he's in. He's bored with all these flies that he's sweeping away from him. They don't present mm. any sense of danger to him. And the way that he talks, he's an evil incarnate. Everything that he says oozes venom. He's destroying you. He's literally destroying Luke with his words alone. He's like, go look out the window. The fleet is there. Your feeble friends are no match for me. And then I was waiting for that in Reve Revenge of the Sith. It's the movie I'm still hyped for, despite what they experienced previous two movies. I'm like, come on, bring it home, George. I'm rooting for it. I'm a Star Wars fan. I always will be. I'm like, come on, let's get this. And it felt like when Ian McDiarmid is getting in the groove of being the Emperor, every, like, there's a couple of lines that he says, like, and there will be peace. And that, that, that tiny smile come up. At times he nails it, and you know the talent is there, and the memory of playing the character is there. But then the next moment he sounds once again like a puppet. And there will be. And it's like, come on, you're not dealing with like a street performer. This is triple A class theatrical actor. I know he can do it. It just did the, the execution didn't work for me. And, when and he's I in execute order sixty six as well. He is quite a silly. It's got that weirdness where it's not the slowness yeah. that you say, yeah. like the dragon. It's the execute order 66. It's like, does he yeah. ever speak like that and, in the original? And we know that he's still got his chops because when we go to Rise of the Skywalker, whether you whether you love his that. presence there or not, the moment I saw him, you know what made me nerd out completely? I'm like, okay, this is the most unimaginable return ever. Who gives a damn? Let me just watch him. Is this going to be the kind of Palpatine that ever... Oh, yeah, this is 1983 Palpatine. Mm. Immediately, like, it doesn't skip a beat. He looks different. He looks awkward, very intentionally so. But he sounds right. But, yeah, it's for some reason, it just uh, didn't work for me as well. Um, the last question I have for us is, again, it's a little bit of cheating, but still. Anakin transforms into Vader at the very end of the film. And we hear, what, like one or two lines from James Earl Jones. Just to give him like a freebie, like, yeah, yeah, you can be in this movie too, because it's Vader, that's what the character is. So I wanted to get your thoughts on Anakin, but not Vader voice acting, that we didn't get James Earl Jones in this final film. Were you okay with it? Like, did you like it? Did you have any thoughts about this? Well, as in you saying... Are you saying and obviously that, in retrospect, because when you saw it first, you were a kid. But seeing it now over and over again, did, do you feel that the lack of that very specific voice type and that accent that James Earl Jones brings to the character, was it something that is missed in prequel films? So are you saying that, be, are you saying that because we didn't hear... Are you asking me about Hayden Christensen's performance or are you asking me that, about James Earl Jones not being in the end of Revenge of the Sith? The fact, the fact that we got Hayden Christensen perform the role throughout the film and the fact that we didn't we get any of Darth Vader mm. in costume but we, and we didn't get any James Earl, uh, Earl Jones lines except for one or two, do you feel that it was missed in the film? Do you feel that it was something that the film was lacking? Obviously, no. in retrospect, because I don't know how you were interacting with it when you first saw it. Funny enough, when I first saw Revenge of the Sith at the cinema, I didn't like it very much. Um, 
which is weird. And then I rewatched it and I loved it. And for me, it's mm. my favorite Star Wars film. Um, but I mean, <clears throat> I'm glad that they <clears throat> didn't have too much of Vader in the suit in Revenge of the Sith. I think if they made mm. the prequels now, he would have gone into the suit like in the Mace, Mace Windu battle. I think if they remade it now and the prequels never been made, but with today's kind of environment and stuff, and if someone if there was more like if Disney still somehow bought Star Wars and they had more execs involved, I think what would have happened is Anakin would have gone into the Mace Windu Palpatine fight, fought Mace Windu in that battle, been heavily scarred and mm. stuff. And that would have made him Vader. And then he would have been the suit Vader for the rest of the movie, killing children and stuff. I think that's what they would have done. Um, and I think it would have worsened it. I think it would have cheapened it because I think it would have made it too. You know, one of the things I like about the prequel trilogy more so than I like the sequel trilogy is that it feels like a trilogy. It feels like the films are all connected. It stands alone. You can watch the prequels and never watch the originals. I don't know why anyone would, but you can do that. And you can watch the originals without watching any of the others. Both of them stand by themselves. Right. The the sequel trilogy doesn't as well. It it could, you you know, I know a new generation of Star Wars fans introduced to the sequel trilogy, but you you do kind of need to watch the others, especially the original trilogy to really uh, get, understand the gravity of the situation otherwise palpatine's just this old bloke in a <laughs> in a storm planet and you're like why is he here why is he evil <laughs> i don't get it um but prequels i found that really work as a their own films and i feel like without james o jones being in it apart from right at the very end very a small amount being done i feel like that really works and although I know Hayden Christensen is not the best actor in the world, I still think he did a good job for what he was given. I like all of Anakin's acting in Render the Sith. I think he does an excellent job. I think in Attack of the Clones, his mainly weaker lines come from the Padme r- romance. If you can even call it romance, there's no chemistry there I could. whatsoever. <laughs> <laughs> I could. I but, definitely could. <laughs> but um, with with aside from the, sort of the, the direction from George Lucas in the dialogue, I think that Hayden Christensen do, still did a great job. And I really think that you do feel the change when he becomes Vader after the Mace Windu battle. And I know this isn't specifically what you were asking, but I want to highlight that I really like Hayden Christensen's voice acting in Revenge of the Sith because he goes in three stages. You've got standard Anakin, you've got sad Anakin, and then you've got angry Darth Vader. The moment after the whole Mace Windu thing happens, and every time it happens, I'm always hoping it doesn't. Even though I've seen the film like 50 times, I'm like... Anakin, don't do it. Don't slice off Maynard Swindler's arm. You can, you can do it. Still watching it, be like, please don't do it. And then it happens. Like, Fuck. <laughs> but when it happens, <laughs> right. and you've got Anakin on the floor, and he's on his knees in front of Palpatine, and he's like, you know, what have I done? That sort of thing. You can hear it in his voice. You can hear the worry. And in that conversation, it changes from the worry, the sadness, the young boy on Tatooine, and it changes to the determined, the fierce, the you know, scary of Darth Vader without the James Earl Jones sort of um, vocalizer to it. And when he's in that thing and when he's angry and especially when he's on Mustafa and he's yelling and things that you've, you, you really, I felt the anger. I felt the emotion. And I think that with Darth Vader, if they'd have put Darth Vader halfway through the film, you lose the emotional side of things because you don't get any emotions out, out of Vader aside from in Revenge of uh, Return of the Jedi. There's two main Vader emotional, three main Vader emotional bits that all happen very quick succession. You've got when Luke is taken up the elevator on Endor and then Vader's just there by himself and he just stares out. That's really well, but obviously that's just all um, body language. Then you've got the bit which they stupidly added a no part in, which I despise, when Annika, when Vader's looking at uh, Luke being electrocuted by Palpatine and back and forth and back and forth, uh, and then he you know, lifts him up. The no bit completely ruins that bit. But the other emotional bit is when Vader takes his helmet off and he talks to Luke more so as Anakin. When, aside from those very small scenes, you don't get emotion out of Vader. He is like at some point when you're watching it, especially before you find out more in the later films, you don't know, is he a robot? Is he a person? Is He's more man than machine now. He's, like, he's more machine than man now. You're like, oh, so he was a man. But you don't know. It's the mystery, but you, there's no real emotion to him. So when you've got him in the prequels, I don't want an emotionless Vader because we got three movies of, of emotionless Vader. Hmm. I, I wanted okay. to see what became Vader. And I think it's a quite a good... I mean, this is something George Lucas does very well visually is I think it works really well when you've got Hayden Christensen, Anakin being emotional and sad, happy, angry, in love, whatever. You've got that variety of emotions and you see him. 
once he's in the suit, you don't see his face. His voice doesn't change. They are the two versions. And when he's in the suit, he is more machine than man. So he has no emotion. So I think it really works for me personally. And they still had it at the end of the film, which linked enough to the original trilogy. And you still get the satisfaction of the Vader, Frankenstein sort of moment, getting off the table. Although he says no, and it ruins it a little bit. You still get those parts. So for me, it worked really well, the amount they used Vader. I just wish they hadn't said the stupid no bit. Really. <laughs> That's the only criticism of Vader's yeah. usage in Revenge of the Sith. But uh, do you have a conflicting opinion to that? I do. Uh, but before I do, I want to say that your and my theories will be definitely put to the test when Kenobi Show comes out. I think there'll be an excellent opportunity to explore that very concept. Mm. I don't know if they're going to introduce James Earl Jones' voice or have a like sounding act. I mean, he's 90 years older and I don't know if he's, I don't know if he's still working, but it'll be a very interesting uh, test. But um, I think some of the most emotional scenes in Star Wars are with Vader in Helmet. Right. Look, I am your father. This and this happened. He never told you what happened to your father. You learned to control your fear. All of that to me, just thinking about those scenes is so one of the most emotional scenes, which I felt that I have the biggest grievance with Star Wars Special Editions, is when Palpatine is torturing Luke. Vader is silent in that scene. He doesn't say, yeah. no, he's silent. And yeah. through cinematography, you are given immense emotion, even without dialogue. He's standing there and just doing this, and flashes reflecting off of his helmet, like, oh my God. Uh, I think it's very manageable, you could do it. I think, to me, one of my major critiques of Star Wars prequels is that they begin in the wrong place. You don't begin the story at the beginning because your main hero is too young to have any purposeful influence on his own life. Everything is done for Anakin mm -hmm. through the fault and none of the fault of his own. He's too young. He's a slave. There's nobody to help him. Qui-Gon pro provides the, the ship, the pod. He provides the dice roll that changes his fate, blah, 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 everything. If we would have started the first episode with young and eager, impulsive young Anakin living side by side with his brother Owen and say, Dad, Dad, having a regular father, like, I, I can't do this anymore. I can't stare at all this sand. There is more potential to my life. Let's go out there and explore. And if you bring that impulsiveness and rage and aggression from the beginning, I think there would have been a lot more room to explore that transformation throughout three films, not just one film. Yes, there is a tragedy of losing his mother in Attack of the Clones, but the driving point happens in episode three where, okay, it's I'm haunted by these nightmares of my wife dying. I lost my mom in this previous episode. I can't do this anymore. I'm going to completely flip the switch. If we would have spent three movies there in the beginning or the first third of the revenge, uh, 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 Re uh, revenge of the Sith, he transforms into Vader. And let's say, you know, when he describes his last encounter with Obi-Wan Kenobi, perhaps it's not the one that maims him, but he has that duel when he's completely altered his, his uh, allegiances. And then, like you said, in that final fight with Mace Windu, who is the ass-beater with his Vapod, you know, technique with, with wielding the dark side as a Jedi, he could have potentially beat Anakin, completely disfigured him. I think it would have been an excellent opportunity to first bring back James Earl Jones, bring that aggression, bring that Anakin stepping into the role now of this of, of Empress Henchman. And what would have happened dialogue-wise from within the mask as Hayden Christensen? And, and regretting all the decisions that he's made and his wife is fleeing him and escaping with the children and she's not dying in childbirth. It just happens and enrages him even more. And we have the internal dialogue performed by Hayden Christensen, who, like yourself, I loved his performance in Revenge of the Sith. But then we are outside of the mask and now we're dealing with him. His, the, the goodness in him is slowly dying and he's becoming more and more Vader through the voice of James Earl Jones. Hmm. Yeah, it's very interesting. It's, it's an interesting point. I take what you say about uh, Empire Strikes Back. That is an emotional scene with the, uh, you know, no, I am your father part. Um, I, 
I think with Vader, he, you can do emotion with someone like that, you know, with as we've seen in especially the fifth and the sixth uh, movies. And I do agree completely that I think that in episode one, A, it's too early, and B, they played so hard that Anakin's this nice person with no vengeance whatsoever. And it's like, you needed to show a hint of it. What I would have liked is maybe in the pod race where no one saw, he rams someone off the road and gets them killed and he's a little bit happy about it. They just something like that. Or like Sebulba doesn't get killed, which is an insult to me. Sebulba should have died in The Phantom Menace. Don't give a damn. Everyone else seems to die in that pod race except the one person who's the worst person in the whole movie who's yeah. awful to everyone. And he lives. You're like, what? What tragedy is this? Um, he should have killed Sebulba. I think that would have been a good thing. And then maybe he just yeah. quietly says to someone, maybe even Padme or someone being like, I enjoyed killing him. He was bad. He should have died. And then Qui-Gon goes, no, no, you can't kill. Just one line of dialogue, something like that. Oh, I wish I'd killed Sebulba. Why? Because I hate him. And it's like, calm Excellent down. points, yeah. Take a step back. But mm-hmm. they didn't. It was just like, oh, he's a perfect little kid. Okay, next movie. He is slaughtering children. You're like, I'm sorry, what? Oh, they're sad people though. Okay. I mean, I, that's one of my favorite scenes of Attack of the Clones. I think the music, the visuals, everything yeah. about it. The act, the acting by Shmi Skywalker when she's... um, Yeah, when you, uh, when the touching dies. scenes. Very much so. Um, So I, I, I get your points. I, I think that there's kind of the problem is the prequels it comes down to excluding the accent element of the conversation is just that george lucas got about 80 percent of it i'd say right and 10 percent mm-hmm. of the wrongness is for me jar jar but the rest of it is just the broad story strokes work you mm-hmm. just needed someone to edit it or tweak that or say george why don't you try that one again add this line of dialogue add this line right you you changed five ten percent of the prequels they would have been held almost the same regard as the original trilogy but instead You've just got lots of little missteps that, as you say, pull you out of it. However, I think to round this element up is that I don't think there's any accents in Star Wars that pulled me out of it, aside from Palpatine saying no when he shocks uh, Mace Windu. I still watch that now, and it's still like, oof. The more I watch it, the more it's just a bit like, It's cringy, oh yeah. yeah. It's very cringy. No one... <laughs> No one talks about that. And if you were like this little gremlin who's just suddenly got superpowers, maybe so. But Palpatine's like the most powerful force user in all of canon. And yeah. also in Legends, apart from like Abeloth and Nihilus, he's still one of the most powerful force users in Legends. So you're just like, so in the Star Wars universe, both the 40 year history and the more recent sort of 10 ish year history, he's so unfathomably powerful. Well, and when he's zapping someone, he goes, no, 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 no. It's like, where's George Lucas' obsession with saying no? He said, you got Darth Vader saying at the end of Revenge of the Sith, that sucks. He, he adds it to the special edition, which really aggravates me. I like almost all tweaks in the special edition. The song, I get the point, but for me, it doesn't affect too much for me. But the no bit really does. And Palpatine. If you removed those three sets of no's from Star Wars, it would be so much better. I don't know what Lucas <laughs> has got. No's is madness. <laughs> uh, but yeah, um, for me, the accents really help widen the galaxy of Star Wars. And I don't yeah. really think that even with the ones that have got the negative connotations, like the Nemordians or even Watto from other individuals, for me personally, still works for me in the realm of Star Wars. And it still helps me feel immersed in that universe. All right, Mike, thank you so much. It's so many interesting ideas, thoughts, and exchanges, things that I would never have fathomed about. I wonder if there is a part three of this podcast in, well, the, in the, the cards. <laughs> I've, got, I've got a lot of, I have got, I'm not going to say it here now, but John Boyega, uh, I want to, there's quite a lot to say about his accent in Star Wars. So I think if we kind of, if I'm not saying what you should name your own show, but this could almost be, the prequel accents in Star Wars. And also, Ben, if you called them that, more people would probably click it because the Moidian <laughs> stuff is a bit controversial. Yeah. Um, but I think if you did call this episode like the prequels accents in Star Wars, and then we did a sequel discussion, the sequel one, I don't think we were able to talk for as long, but it would be more interesting to speak about Palpatine a lot more in Rise of Skywalker. And then I speak wonder. about, yeah, because yeah, John Boyega, there's a lot to say. Because obviously John Boyega speaks an American accent in that film as opposed to his standard British accent, which yeah. is actually... And our main the, hero doesn't have an American accent anymore. Exactly, yeah. So I think there is there is a decent amount to talk about. And obviously the legacy characters, how their voices change. Although it's right. not strictly speaking accents, the way right. they right. speak. The mannerisms, so think, it's a part of it. 
Yeah, so I think we could do it. This is a three part. All right, guys, uh, you heard it from Michael himself. Part, <laughs> part, part three is happening. It's going to be a trilogy. Uh, no, but thanks so much for um, joining me today. I know I've postponed a couple of times. I love talking about it to you. You always open up like a new gift for me in Star Wars. You know, it's like, pa, pa, pa. oh, like, well, where does this lead? What is this, you know, chocolate flavor? What is that? I constantly come away from our podcast looking at Star Wars in a new way. I think that's the whole idea of this podcast. I think that's the whole idea of fans interacting and sharing opinions which are not similar in any way. You can enjoy what you can enjoy, and I do the same, but we're interested in each other. We're interested in how Star Wars brings everybody together, including the accents. Anyway, guys, I hope you enjoyed this podcast a lot. Please go support Mike on his uh, channels. You know, like and subscribe to this video. Mike, please remind everybody where folks can find you. On social media, at Genuine Chit Chat, on Twitter, Instagram, and Facebook. That's where you can keep up to date with all my stuff. There are snippets of my conversations of Genuine Chit Chats. You can just listen to a minute of a conversation, see if you want to fully delve in. I put up the photos of the Star Wars comics that I delve into, the covers, and a few panels I think are quite cool uh, normally, and just a few other bits and pieces of what I'm watching or doing. So really, and I post generally the same thing on pretty much all social media. On Twitter, there's a bit more you know, interaction, just the, the format that it is. But I'd say if you follow me on Genuine um, chit chat on the social media places or just type it into youtube uh, and they're the best two places for your audience to uh, find me but thank you so much again ben it's always delightful and the same to you that whenever you speak like i did not believe i'd be able to talk about accents and star wars for over three hours in two separate sessions and probably for another at least another hour again and that's not something i'd even considered in star wars so although i may bring you uh, alternate perspectives and you certainly show me some kudos to you sir for setting the platform for it so I thank you for that guys i wait for our snyder for our cut of the sequel action stock it's coming <laughs> it's on the way until then we'll see you guys later thanks so much for checking us out next time